I want to welcome you this evening for the second of a two-part lecture series on the Obama presidency. At this moment, a year after the presidential election and a year before next year's midterm elections, and of course this week we already are hearing about um, discussions of the presidential elect election in 2016. Um, this discussion is part of a question of where is the Obama administration in the stream of American political history? And we're answering the question from, from many people, but um, one person in particular, H. Richard Niebuhr, the, um, the famous ethicist at Yale, said that the first question is always to ask what is going on? And tonight, uh, we have a person who, whose expertise in, is in figuring out what is going on and that's Dr. Theda Scotchpole, the Victor S. Thomas Professor of Government and Sociology at Harvard University. Professor Scotchpole has written many books, um, including Obama and America's Political Future and Social Policy in the United States, and is co-author of Reaching for a New Deal and a new book about the Tea Party. Some of her books are on sale in the back of my colleague, Missy Sargent, and uh, Missy has been a great help in pulling this and all of the Stover program together. Dr. Scotchpole received her PhD from Harvard University in 1979 and has served as the dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Harvard, but she told me that she's happy that she's on to, to other things at this moment. Um, she is the director of the Center for American Political Studies at Harvard, and she served as the president of the Social Science History Association, the president of the American Political Science Association, and was awarded the Joan Skite Prize in Political Science in 2007, and is a co-founder of the Scholars Strategy Network. So um, let us welcome Professor Scotchpole, and uh, welcome to all of you, but um, Professor Scotchpole. Well, thank you very much, and I've really enjoyed my day here and getting a chance to meet uh, a lot of, of, of the students who are studying at, at uh, this college, and I'm looking forward to our discussion at the end of my remarks and to meeting some more people tomorrow. So thank you all for being so warmly welcoming of um, someone arriving from uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So. Let me start by reminding us of the huge and joyful crowd that greeted Barack Obama in Chicago's Grant Park on November 5th, 2008, after the conclusion of what was truly one of the historic elections in um, the 200 years of our nation's history because the first African American was elected uh, President of the United States. Uh, that crowd was full of people of all ages, including uh, the many young volunteers who had helped to propel his campaign, but also older African-American men and women with tears streaming down their faces because they never thought that they would live to see such a remarkable day. And in fact, around that time of the election, uh, Americans of all political persuasions and all parts of the country were very proud of what had happened in the United States uh, with that election, even though, of course, many were sad at the particular party outcome. Within two weeks, Time Magazine uh, put uh, Barack Obama on its cover. It's a striking cover. I forgot to bring my copy along, but it has Obama sitting in an open automobile like Franklin Delano Roosevelt with a big grin on his face and a cigarette holder in his mouth. Uh, and it's called the New New Deal because there was, as there is often after every election in the United States, there's a lot of commentary to the effect that everything has changed. Uh, I'm going to tell you in a little bit that everything doesn't always change uh, right away with an election. But there was a lot of commentary after that election to the effect that because Obama had been elected president with substantial majorities of Democrats in both the House and the Senate, uh, and that this was happening in a moment of economic crisis, that perhaps there would be a change of direction in American government policy uh, comparable to what happened in the New Deal of the 1930s under Franklin Roosevelt, 
and that it would be accompanied by, many pundits said, a permanent ascendancy of the Democratic Party fueled by young and minority uh, and women voters. Well, that was then, and then two years later, on November 2010, uh, after the elections for Congress and for state legislatures and governors that year, there was a completely different set of pundit analyses written because in the space of two years, not only had the permanent Democratic majority not emerged that was expected, uh, but a Republican Party and a very conservative Republican Party won uh, the largest um, electoral victories, you could say, in Congress and particularly in many state houses since the 1920s. 63 house, uh, house seats uh, changed hands. Many governorships and state legislative uh, posts changed, hand, changed hands in that election. And uh, suddenly it looked as if uh, perhaps uh, the country had done a U-turn and was headed in completely the opposite direction politically and ideologically. Well, then two years later, there's another presidential election that we all just witnessed last year in 2012 um, where Obama was reelected against the expectations of many analysts and many observers. Not by quite as large a margin as he beat McCain in 2008, but by a very substantial margin, both in the Electoral College and in the popular vote. And Democrats made inroads in the House and, and actually increased their margins in the Senate. So um, this remarkable series of turnarounds from election to election kind of sets the stage for some of the questions that I would like to explore in, in my uh, remarks tonight. First, I'd like to talk about what happened after 2008. What happened to those extravagant expectations that um, government policy would change direction in sharp ways and that that would be accompanied by building a new popular political majority to support that change of direction? Uh, it didn't quite turn out that way. Within a year after that huge election, Obama was disappointing many of his supporters and an explosive and determined opposition had mobilized that made some of those big gains in 2010. How did those gains happen for the Republican Party in 2010, even though, contrary to what most people in my profession of political science expect, the party moved further to the right rather than toward the middle between 2008 and 2010? Uh, what caused that rightward lurch and the Tea Party uh, effervescence that accompanied it and helped to propel it? Uh, and what was, what exactly happened in 2010. And then finally, after things have sort of moved back partway in 2012, where is the country? With such diametrically opposed political forces, um, not just in elections, but in our government in Washington, D.C., that often leads to stalemate, what can we expect? Uh, going forward and how should we think about the meaning of all of this for American democracy and for our country's ability to tackle some of the major challenges before it. So let me start by talking first about that 2008 election and its afterwards and aftermath in what I'm going to call Obama's halfway New Deal. It wasn't a new New Deal and certainly wasn't a complete New Deal but it was in a way a a halfway New Deal. And I want to start just by reminding us why so many pundits expected this to be a huge and permanent change. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not very often that it happens that a president is elected and the House and the Senate have strong majorities in the same party. It does not happen very often for Democrats or Republicans. So part of the reason people thought that the country was poised for big changes in public policy was that Obama was not just elected by the biggest margin of any Democrat that I can remember in a very long time, and I've been around for a while. Um, 
He didn't just squeak in. He actually had a very substantial victory over McCain in 2008. And Democrats gained seats in the House and uh, in the Senate and controlled both houses in a way, in the sense that the leadership could set the agendas. Pundits were also thinking that this was a big change because they were pointing to some facts about the electorate. More Americans voted in, uh, in the 2008 election than had turned out as a proportion of the electorate since the 1960s. The United States is not exactly the world's leader in the proportion of citizens who turn out at the polls. And it's been declining and it, hovering around just 50% of eligible voters for a long time. But in 2008, it was 60%. And a lot of young people voted, and a lot of Latinos and a lot of African Americans. And those groups, along with women, gave Obama his commanding margins. So it looked to some who looked at it superficially like, well, that's the future. Young people are the future, right? So, and the country is becoming browner and blacker over time, so that's the rising electorate. It also mattered that Obama was elected after most Americans of all political persuasions were sick and tired of George W. Bush. The fact of the matter is, fair or not, there was a lot of sourness about him by the time he left office. And frankly, if you're going to be elected president, it's good to be elected, the research shows, after the previous guy is not so popular. Uh, it's, it's like if you, you know, it's good if you're a dean to take over after a dean who's perceived as a failure rather than a success. And Obama had that going for him. Um, and he had also spoken with unusual frankness during the 2007 and 2008 election about the need to change direction in domestic policy. And I'm mainly going to talk about that. Of course, he also talked about winding down the war in Iraq. But he talked about richer Americans paying a higher share of taxes. He talked about building a bottom-up economy, tackling big challenges in education environment and energy and health care. So he kind of laid out a bold agenda and that's even before the country slid into a massive financial crisis, which was the final thing that made many observers think that this was a moment of change because it was understood that Americans were alarmed at the plunge of the country into a deep recession following the financial meltdown that happened just as the election was happening. And in the first months of Obama's presidency, it sort of looked as if the expectations for a change of direction and a lot of popular support for that might hold good. Obama's popularity ratings were extremely high. Most presidents get pretty good popular ratings at first, but his were even higher for the opening months. And his team very quickly put together a massive American Recovery and Re Reinvestment Act to try to stem the tide of the recession that was unfolding as he took office. Um, he also recommitted his administration to developing a major health care reform and urged forward major new initiatives on the environment, supporting cap and trade legislation. Uh, and that's not even pointing to the various things that were being done in education reform, an attempt to reform the college loan system, uh, launching a, a move toward financial regulation of Wall Street, all of those things. So it was an ambitious agenda, and at first it moved forward. But then it seemed to devolve into extreme conflict and in many cases stalled out. Now, the bottom line is looking at the first two years of Obama's presidency, a lot of major legislative initiatives did pass. In the retrospect of history, this will be seen as a period in which uh, the federal government in the United States changed direction in important ways. So in many ways, a lot of things did change. Health care reform finally passed after 15 months. Um, college loans were changed uh, pretty fundamentally to increase Pell Grants and to reduce the role of the banks in providing loans to college students. Financial regulation eventually passed. 
things happen to encourage uh, the states to compete to do better in K through 12 education. And that's just a few of the things that happened. Uh, there was also uh, most economists of all persuasions agree that the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act prevented the United States and the world economy from plunging into a 1930s style uh, deep recession. In other words, it stemmed the tide and laid the basis for slow job growth, which is what we've had ever since. So, you know, in the policy realm, you could say that a kind of, of, of change of direction did really happen that was quite ambitious. But what certainly didn't happen was the building up of popularity and political support for all of this, and many of the things that Obama hoped to do uh, toward the end of his first two years and then in the, in the next parts of his presidency have not come to fruition and will not come to fruition uh, because of congressional opposition. So what happened? Now, in my work, I found it useful to think about how the Obama presidency compared to what happened in the 1930s with Franklin Roosevelt, not because these were the same, but they're interesting to compare for the following reason. There are moments when the country is in deep economic crisis, when a Democratic president comes to office backed by Democrats in Congress with an ambitious agenda to use the federal government to move the economy in new directions and to uh, expand opportunity and security for the middle and the bottom of the, of, of the social order. Uh, so uh, these are ambitious, reform-minded Democrats coming to office at a moment of economic crisis with Democrats in Congress. But that's where the similarity ends. The rest of the comparison helps to us to see some of the things that made it impossible for many of Obama's supporters to see that he was doing things they might like, and for his opponents to become quickly mobilized, and I would say pretty much 100% mobilized in opposition uh, to what he uh, was trying to do. So let me just mention a few of the big differences between the 2008-9 period and the 1930s. The first thing to realize is that Back in the 1930s, the, the country was four years into the Great Depression when Franklin Roosevelt moved into the White House. The first four years, while unemployment rose to 25% of the workforce, at least. That's what it was measured at. It's always higher than it's actually measured. Uh, Herbert Hoover, Republican president, was in the White House. So by the time Roosevelt arrived in 1933, and he wasn't even inaugurated for four months after he was elected, because there was a long span there between election and inauguration, uh, by that time, people in the United States were so desperate for something new to be happening, to turn that around, that believe it or not, the Congress passed the legislation that Franklin Roosevelt sent to them without even reading the bills. Sometimes the bills weren't even written down before Congress voted on them by large bipartisan majorities. And furthermore, Franklin Roosevelt never had to deal very much with Herbert Hoover. He just sort of let Herbert Hoover serve out his waning months, and then he rolled in as the savior, quote unquote. Well, think about the difference in 2008 and 2009. The big financial meltdown on Wall Street started while Obama was still running for president. It was a month before the election that that happened. Remember McCain and Obama go to, went to the White House to try to save the country. Um, huh. And, uh, so Obama was sitting there with his advisors talking about how to cooperate with George W. Bush to prevent the Wall Street meltdown from turning into a global recession. He held hands with Herbert Hoover, in essence. He couldn't separate himself entirely from the previous regime. And by the time the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, so-called stimulus, was passed, many Americans thought it was one and the same thing with the bailout of Wall Street that had actually happened under George W. Bush's watch. 
So the timing of the crisis was very different. Obama didn't arrive when Americans were desperate for strong action to create jobs. He arrived just as the crisis was unfolding, and he got involved in trying to prevent the banks from going under, which was not a very popular thing with most Americans uh, as they watched their own retirement accounts shrink and the jobs be lost in their communities. And yet, Obama really didn't have any choice. I mean, I know there are a lot of people, like Paul Krugman or say, could have done everything differently. I don't think so, because it was all happening just as he was taking office, and they had to take immediate action to keep a crisis from being much worse than it was. But think about trying to sell that to Americans over the next several years who are watching their jobs disappear, watching mortgages go underwater, saying it could have been worse than it is, is not a great political slogan. So that's number one. Number two, I mentioned that back in the 1933 period, Franklin Roosevelt initially had overwhelming bipartisan support for his efforts to get the economy going again at the nadir of the Great Depression. Well, we now know even more than we knew when I first did the research on this, that Republican leaders met the night of Barack Obama's inauguration to hatch a plan to just say no to everything he proposed. I think it's fair to say that Obama did not expect that. He expected a modicum of compromise and cooperation in a national economic crisis. And he wasn't really prepared for the fact that no matter how many compromises he offered, and he offered quite a few on tax cuts, for example, uh, he offered so many that Democrats got angry at him, hard as that may be to believe. Uh, his offers of compromise were never accepted. Because Republican leaders had just lost a shocking election. They were looking out at a country in which the pundits were all saying they were going the ways of the dinosaurs, and they were hoping to find a way to turn it around. So they looked at the situation and they said to themselves, you know, this crisis is gonna go on. We don't like what these Democrats want to do, so we'll just say no. Uh, if it works, we don't think it will, if it doesn't work completely, then at the next election, we can do better. That was the bet they placed, and actually it was a rational bet. But what it meant was that very quickly in Obama's presidency, he was facing an almost solid wall of partisan opposition. So things played out, and most Americans out there in the world don't want the two parties to be at each other's throats. They want cooperation. You know, I mean, Americans of all persuasions vote for these people. We do. We're responsible for their being there. But most Americans don't actually like it that bargains can't be struck and cooperation and compromise worked out in the middle. So this whole playing played out over the next uh, two to four years and even to the present with a degree of partisan polarization and all-out opposition to Obama and the Democrats that uh, gave the whole thing a different flavor from some of the kinds of cooperation in national economic emergencies or national wartime emergencies that we've seen between the two parties in the past. Now I'll mention a couple of other things. The media today make a difference. As recently as the 1960s, most Americans got their news by watching three television networks at supper time. I remember, you know, there was CBS, ABC, and NBC. And they all said pretty much the same thing. And if you wanted to watch TV at television, uh, television at dinner time, that was all there was to watch. So most Americans heard the same facts. Maybe they thought, well, we'd like less taxes or more taxes or more regulation or less regulation, but they heard the same facts. Well, that's not what we've got now. And that makes a big difference for the way politics works in Washington. 
Uh, about uh, 30 to 40 percent of Americans, particularly older white people, get all of their information from Fox News. Younger people often don't bother to watch news, or they just watch Colbert and Stewart, or they check around on the internet, or they watch sports, uh, which I admit I, I do too. Sometimes I've, I've, I mean, I've, I'm a political scientist, but sometimes I've had it. I just got to do sports. Um, and the vast uh, muddled middle sort of watches a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Uh, and people can select their news outlet to hear what they already think. And the sense of facts that are shared is just no longer there. That makes it very difficult for a reform-oriented president to get his message across. And although Obama, like FDR in the 30s, has been an innovator, FDR in the 30s used these fireside chats on the radio, and Obama uses those little videos that he puts out every Saturday. They don't reach nearly as many Americans, and lots of people are, are living in a different factual universe or, or a not-so-factual universe compared to the others. Now, the final two things I want to mention are that almost all the changes Obama was sponsoring, changing the tax code, reforming the health care system, changing the college loan system, regulating Wall Street. All of those things were going to be complicated new sets of regulations, taxes, subsidies, piled on top of an already large and dense federal government. In the 1930s, when the first New Deal happened, Democrats and Franklin Roosevelt were sponsoring things like Social Security, the minimum wage, uh, regulation of hours and at workplaces, uh, farm loans that were happening for the first time in peacetime that the federal government was playing a major role in the economy. Most Americans might like it or not like it, but they were pretty clear what was happening and it was starting in a fairly new ground. Well, by the time you get to Barack Obama in 2008, as a matter of fact, by the time you get to Bill Clinton in 1993, or the Bushes in between, <laughs> the federal government in the United States is pretty large, and it's pervasively involved in all aspects of life, the environmental regulation, workplace regulation, health care, Anybody who thinks the U.S. government isn't involved in health care, i got news for you. I mean, it's all over health care, uh, before Obamacare. So um, what Obama was proposing to do was to change the direction of an already huge and dense set of federal regulations, taxes, and subsidies. But often to change it in complicated ways that would be hard for ordinary citizens to see. So uh, the legislation took forever to get through Congress. Many ordinary Americans looked and said, you know, I don't know what's going on there in that 1,000 uh, 1, or 2,000 page bill, but it can't be good if they're doing it in Washington. Um, and so he had the disadvantage of trying to shift directions in ways that were often invisible. That helps us to understand why many of the things Obama did that Democrats say they would like to have done, many Democrats don't even know have been done. Most Americans do not know what's in the Affordable Care Act. Um, the polls show that most Americans even admit that they don't know what's in the Affordable Care Act, and that's remarkable because usually people won't tell a pollster that they don't know something. They usually say, oh yeah. I know. Um, but the opponents of what Obama was doing, the people who didn't like the higher taxes on business and the rich that were part of a lot of these changes, who didn't like the new regulations of the insurance industry, who didn't like changing the bank's role in college loans, they knew immediately what it was all about. So you had a situation in which the friends and supporters didn't know what was happening, still don't in many cases, and the enemies were immediately aware. And that's not even to take into account the fact 
that whenever a president of one party backed by Congress of the same party takes office, Americans on the other side of the spectrum react with fear and anger. That is a regularity. It happened when Bill Clinton took office. It happened when George uh, W. Bush uh, uh, moved into the White House after the 2000 election, and it, and it happened uh, again in 2008. Okay, so that brings me to the second thing I'd like to talk about briefly, which is the remarkable emergence of the Tea Party, which burst onto the scene less than a month after Obama was installed in the White House. The Tea Party um, at first uh, confused a lot of observers. It took the form of a lot of older white people carrying signs on the corner saying that Obama was a Nazi, a communist, and a socialist. That, of course, was irresistible for television cameras. I mean, after all, how often do you get to see otherwise fairly staid people dressed up in colonial costumes carrying signs like that? Uh, but what seemed like a media curiosity at first soon grew into regional demonstrations, eventually into 900 local tea parties that were formed by volunteers at the grassroots all over the United States that met usually once a month, sometimes as often as once a week. Um, that's pretty remarkable. I can tell you as somebody who's studied groups in American life, there aren't very many groups that emerge like that where people put in the effort to have meetings that often. Uh, and of course, by 2010, Tea Party people were winning Republican primaries, putting up their own candidates, and they played a big role in the 2010 election. Uh, and there are now Tea Party identified Republicans sitting in many state legislatures and about 70 in the U.S. House of Representatives, responsible for moving the House of Representatives from being very conservative in the first two years of Obama's presidency on the Republican side of the ledger to being so conservative that quantitative political scientists have never seen such measures far to the right uh, since 2010. So what happened here? Uh, well, you know, I mean, one of my graduates and students and I decided to try to find out after this phenomenon burst because we wanted to know what was this? What were these protests? Why were they having such a big impact? And why were they changing the public discussion so quickly after an apparently popular president moved into the White House and was trying to set a different agenda? We ended up visiting local tea parties in Arizona, several parts of Virginia and several parts of New England, sitting down for one-on-one -on -one confidential interviews with um, tea party activists, men and women, often women actually, who uh, formed local tea parties, hearing their stories about how they got their tea parties going and what they thought about things, and able to ask them in those one-on-one -on -one confidential settings questions that are very different from what reporters notice when they attend a rally and just focus on the angriest sign in the, in the audience. Uh, we ended up concluding that the Tea Party was uh, a combination of top-down and bottom-up forces that were aiming to push the Republican Party as much as the Democrats from the right. At the grassroots, Tea Party people, and we based this on our interviews and our observations and also on national surveys so that we could cross-check what we were learning with a few Tea Partiers against representative surveys. At the grassroots, Tea Party people are older, overwhelmingly white men and women, and when I say older, I mean 45 and above and usually 60 and above. Um, certainly the ones who form the local tea parties. And they are about half of them, Christian conservatives, as well as uh, Tea Party uh, patriots. Um, but some Tea Party people are libertarians who may not be churchgoers. Um, they have always been very conservative-minded, and they were fed up with George W. Bush and didn't much think much of McCain, either. Um, and even less of him after he lost the election. Uh, they are 
uh, very much opposed to the kinds of things they perceived Obama and the Democrats trying to do to tax real Americans, real Americans being themselves, to pay for benefits that they think of as welfare for freeloaders and moochers. And I'm not using words that I make up. I'm using words I heard when I sat down with people. In our interviews, we really liked the people that we met individually. Many of them are absolutely admirable. A woman who learned to organize by running volunteer theater productions in her town and transferred what she learned to organizing the Tea Party. Another a woman who has a black foster child and arrived with a pin on her lapel that said, don't worry, God's in charge. She's a Tea Party leader in one part of Virginia. In Arizona, my partner, Vanessa Williamson, who was at that time 28 years old, was warmly welcomed into the homes of Tea Party people and taken to observe their meetings. We were invariably treated with politeness, despite the fact that we are Cambridge liberals, not a favorable category in Tea Party land. But what we heard from people was anger and fear. Our country is being taken away from us, people said. They pointed to large numbers of immigrants and were certain that health care reform was designed to give them free health care, even though the law explicitly refuses to give any help to undocumented immigrants. They were against Pell Grants for college students because they told us many young people today are not prepared to work hard and pay their dues. They are strongly in favor of cracking down on abortion, homosexual rights, and immigration, particularly those who are social conservatives as well as Tea Partiers. And we ultimately ask people in our interviews to tell us what they thought about the most expensive things that the federal government does. Social Security, Medicare, defense, and military veterans benefits. Large numbers of Tea Partiers are collecting Social Security, Medicare, and military veterans benefits. And they told us just what most Americans would say. We approve of those. We've earned them. We've worked hard all our lives. We deserve those benefits. So we learned a lot by the interviews and a lot by observing the meetings, which all start with the Pledge of Allegiance and some start with a prayer. Sometimes the prayer mentions Jesus and sometimes the prayer doesn't mention Jesus because there are some Jewish Tea Partiers. Uh, and sometimes there's an argument in the local Tea Party about whether to do that, to, to have a prayer at the beginning. But there's never any argument about the Pledge of Allegiance. That's the grassroots part. But the Tea Party is also two other things, and they're top-down. Media coverage that takes the form of cheerleading, not just reporting on uh, right-wing talk radio and on Fox News. And Tea Party people told us that they watched Fox News six to eight hours a day, so most of their news comes from that source. One man said when we got to that question, and said, where do you get your news? He looks at me and he smiles and he says, not where you do. So I had a sense of humor about that, and uh, indeed. So um, that, the media cheerleading is important, and the other thing that's important are wealthy ideological advocacy groups that existed before Barack Obama even appeared on the scene nationally, like Americans for Prosperity, Freedom Works, uh, plus some uh, Republican uh, election funding operations that changed their name after the Tea Party emerged. They have a different agenda 
they are pushing what they have always been pushing, which is lower taxes on business, on the wealthy, lower uh, regulation on business, and privatization of Social Security and Medicare. And they jumped on the Tea Party bandwagon and are pushing in the same direction. We concluded that this entire set of things that made up the Tea Party was not one big organization. It wasn't either bottom up or top down, it was both. And the forces were all pushing in the direction, of course, of opposing Obama and Democrats, but also of trying to move Republican candidates and Republican office holders to the right and away from any possibility of compromise with Democrats. So it's an anti-compromise oriented politics. It's a sort of kick-ass politics, I call it where the thrilling figures are those who say, no, I won't support anything as long as Obamacare is there. And obviously, this Tea Party phenomenon has had an enormous impact on the Republican Party over the last several years. About half of Tea Party, uh, about half of Republican voters who tell national pollsters that they are Republicans are Tea Party sympathizers. And their attitudes on issues of compromise are completely different from other Republicans, let alone moderates and Democrats. Um, by 2010, these folks who are very good citizens, they vote, they pay attention, they send letters and emails to their representatives, they turn out for meetings. They had made a lot of progress in taking over parts of the Republican Party all over the United States, and they had an impact in electing people of like mind against compromise in 2010. And the other important thing to keep in mind about the 2010 election is that it was an exaggerated version of what often happens in midterm elections. I spoke uh, a year or so ago to I went to Denmark, to southern Denmark, to speak about health care. You know, a thousand Danes turned out. And I'm thinking, I know they're interested in health care, but really that many people? What they wanted to know was how the United States could elect Barack Obama in 2008 and then turn around in 2010 and go in such a different direction. They look at America and they just don't get it. Um, and so I said, you know, there really is a very simple thing that you need to remember about American politics. In presidential election years now, three out of every five eligible voters go to the polls. In midterm elections, particularly in 2010, it's two out of five. And the ones who stayed home in 2010 were young people, lower income people, and minorities. Uh, they were deeply discouraged by the depth of the recession, and they bore the brunt of it. And they just didn't turn out in that election. On the other hand, Tea Party Republicans really did turn out, and a lot of other Americans who were angry about what was happening or not happening in the economy turned out and did what Americans always do in a down economy. They threw out the bums that are in for the, dumb, the other bums uh, and expect that uh, something will change as a result of that, and are often disappointed. So that's where we were after two swing elections. What about now? Because we've had one more election. Tea Party forces in the Republican Party bet heavily on the 2012 election. They assumed that very conservative Republicans could take over the Senate, as well as the House, and they assumed, as did many political scientists going into it, that Barack Obama could not be reelected given the continuing high unemployment rates in the country and the deep disillusionment even of many of his supporters at uh, the failure of some of their favorite reforms. You see, most Americans don't understand that it takes 60 votes to pass things in the Senate. They really don't. They think, Democrats in charge, why aren't they doing things? Or they think Democrats in charge got to get rid of the Democrats to stop them from doing things. 
Uh, but of course, what was really going on after 2010 was that not very much was happening, one way or the other. It was a stalemate. On the other hand, in the end, Obama was reelected, and he was reelected by a very substantial margin, in part because Mitt Romney was not an inspiring candidate to many middle of the road Americans, and also because in the course of winning the Republican nomination, he signed on to all of the Tea Party principles, including reducing taxes on the wealthy, uh, suggesting that the 11 million undocumented should self-deport, which really doesn't go over in Latino communities, I can, I can tell you. I mean, it, it just doesn't go over, uh, because that's your grandmother or your cousin uh, that we're talking about here. Um, so Obama was reelected. The Senate actually moved more in the Democrats' direction, but perhaps more significantly, a new generation of senators began to move in in both political parties, uh, more liberal on the Democratic side and much more conservative on the Republican side with, for example, Ted Cruz in Texas winning, winning um, the, the Senate seat there. And the House of Representatives, Three quarters of the Tea Party Republicans who won office for the first time in 2010 were reelected. So, what do we have? We have Tea Party forces really pretty securely ensconced. I haven't even talked about all the states where they have a major presence, not just in the South, but in Ohio, here in Pennsylvania, in part, Wisconsin, Florida, Maine. Tea Party governor, elected with 37% of the vote when the other two split the vote. Uh, and yet the Democrats reelected Obama and gained ground in the Senate. So what we've got now is a situation in which these two major forces for change, pushing in very different directions, both feel that they have a mandate from the American electorate. And we've seen one standoff after another. And I hate to tell you this, but we're going to keep right on seeing one standoff after another in Washington. Some standoffs have sort of been, quote, won by President Obama, who was able to finally, after years of Sturm und Drang, ask Americans making over $400,000 a year to pay a little bit more in taxes. That's it. On the other hand, as you all know, Republicans, particularly Tea Party Republicans, remain determined to try to stop the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, even to the point of being willing to close down the government a move that 80% of Americans did not want to see happen. And they still have to come up with a budget. They haven't come up with one, and it's going to be very hard to do it when on the one hand, you have a party that's determined to spend at least as much as we are and maybe a bit more on education, health care, environmental protection, and another party that wants to roll back things in those areas and reduce taxes. So uh, what can we conclude from all of this? I'll open the discussion and you can tell me because I don't know for sure. I think this country is going through a wrenching period of generational change, which is also tied up with changes in the kinds of people who are part of the American people. Now, you know, the United States has been a country of immigrants through its entire existence. And this country in the past, and it's still true now, takes in people from all over the world and turns them into Americans. And that's happening now with younger people who've come to this country from Asia and Latin America and Mexico. But many of the older grassroots Tea Partiers don't see that actually America is 
being renewed, and it's still America. They see it as a period of fearful loss. And in their way of looking at the world, Barack Obama symbolizes that change that they fear. That's what we concluded in our work. Because what we heard in the quiet one-on-one -on -one interviews was fear more than anger. And, you know, for two of us coming from Cambridge, Massachusetts, trying to understand why uh, perfectly lovely people were afraid of Barack Obama when where we come from, most people think he's a milk toast. Well, that was part of what we were trying to figure out. And we finally decided that, you know, he's a Democrat, that's bad, and that would be a big count against him no matter what. But he has a foreign father, which made him seem a symbol of all these changes in America that people didn't like. He's supported by young people, which in the eyes of many of these older conservatives is not a good thing, and that includes if it's their grandnieces or nephews or their grandkids. Um, and he wanted to do things like make changes in Medicare, they thought, to pay for health care for those people who were taking their country away from them. So that's part of the reason why Obama is such a flashpoint. And that's part of the reason why a health care reform, which, you know, is making changes, but not as big changes as people think, causes such uh, fear and anger and opposition. And I think this is going to go on for a few more years with the stalemate centered on health care reform, taxes, the budget, much more than on the things that it's been about in the past, like foreign policy. But of course, in three more years, Barack Obama won't be there anymore. So whatever he symbolizes, you know, pass away. And three or four years from now will be that much further, we hope, into an economic recovery and that much further into the transformation of America into another version of America that actually is a lot like the America we've always known. People of all backgrounds coming together uh, to work hard get ahead, and make this a better country. So I think it will take a while, but I think these severe conflicts that are as part of generational and ideological as they are Democrats and Republicans will change, and that there will be a new Republican Party within a few years, where moderates, who are actually almost the majority in a lot of places in the party, will once again have a voice that's stronger than the voice they have now. But until that happens, there's going to be a lot of angry words, a lot of conflict, and a lot of stalemate when what most Americans want is for all those guys and gals in Washington to get their act together and help grow the economy. Thank you.